the failures are so much more important because that's where you learn but the failure is where everything is the success is just like eh. like it's just that little spark of okay so everything i learned worked now in this moment presented this way how you present it you can adjust certain components of it that will serve people better that will actually result in much more engagement doing that with art i think is one of the hardest professions to do anyone who wants to be financially successful that it just makes a difference if you can find that balance without losing yourself and your own ever-evolving identity. In this episode, I talked to Ergo Josh. He grew really fast over only a couple of years. In this episode, we talk about his experience and his thoughts being that person in the spotlight and his feelings surrounding creativity and what it actually means to be successful. Thanks and enjoy the episode. The way I usually start these things um, is the purpose of this is, is not to talk about how to become an artist, how to become a better draftsman, how to do really anything technically. It's more about the why of doing it. Okay. You know? And I think a lot of people focus on pure draftsmanship, pure studying, pure essentially doing what they are told by other people to do. You know, go study your fundamentals, go study anatomy at the expense or at the cost of kind of people doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. You know, people going and, you know, doing their graphic novel or creating their original characters or any of that kind of stuff. They learn too much to the point where they procrastinate. And I guess the reason I wanted to talk to you is, like, I know a little bit about your past and your history. It's like you... You're pretty new to YouTube in the past, like five or you know, five-ish years. Like you started during COVID, right? That's when I started um, getting really. That was like my second big wave, but I got popular like eight, 2018. Well, and I, I think a lot of people look at uh, people who are successful on YouTube or successful at anything, and they think that that's either unattainable or they have to do an absurd amount of work to get there. And as I'm moving forward, it seems like people to you know actually make progress towards doing something, you have to just start doing, mm -hmm. it, you know, and I guess I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, facing your fears, doing things uh, that are creative, you know, kind of trusting your own voice and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Like, I, I was actually kind of hoping it wouldn't be all just like an interview thing, because I feel like everyone's already heard <laughs> about me already. But that is a great question, because I've actually been going through, I think, maybe second, third, fourth, fifth phase of that where I realized that I had been consuming so much information that it slowed me down a lot and took all the joy out of creating stuff. Um, so I found that having a balance of gathering information, studying is extremely important with making sure you're doing the thing that you want to do. So right now, one of the videos I'm working on is talking about how I want to redefine what practicing is. And practicing is just doing the, the final thing, but doing it now, right? So if you want to be an animator, making animations now, because you're practicing for that animation that you dream of or whatever. And that's the thing that keeps it fun and exciting. But when you're studying and researching and gathering references and looking at how everyone else did it, you give yourself too much reason to procrastinate, give up, whatever. And it is, I found at least my brain is extremely insidious with that. Like I have to, it's like giving, it's like giving it ammo to use to like shoot me with like, Oh, doesn't look good. Doesn't look like this guy's work. What about what they did? It's like, I got to just empty the barrel so that I can just create. Well, and, and I feel like people, uh, like the ease in which people talk themselves into not doing the things they want to do is pretty insane. Like it's pretty common. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's actually more so the problem that people face more so than draftsmanship skills or, you know, their access to art teachers or money or any of that kind of stuff, you know? It's people's ability to uh, essentially talk themselves into the thing not being worth doing because it's not financially viable or somebody's already done it or, you know, any number of reasons. And I think for myself, I've been guilty of that in a lot of the same ways other, like everyone else has. Um, and it, I've been especially observing it on YouTube to where I, you know, made a point to try to like 
like surround myself with a bunch of YouTubers, really figure out like how their brains work. And like I worked for Proco for a long time and stuff. And looking back at myself in my early 20s, I would have been better off not studying from Stan, just going and making bad videos by myself alone, you know, like uh, essentially acting under the assumption that I already know everything I need to know. Mm -hmm. It's just my ability to go and have the bravery to go and put myself on camera and try expressing my ideas and stuff. Yeah. YouTube, especially with videos, whenever people ask me, uh, I, I try not to be jaded in my response because it's like the number one thing is like, are you even going to do it? Like, are you even, I, yeah. I know the percentage of people who ask me and who never end up making even one video. So I always tell them just make the video because it is, it is extremely challenging to take the series of risks that it takes to put yourself out there. And it's something that I've refamiliarized myself with. It is very hard. Like the thought of what people in your life are going to think about you is really, really intense for most people. And it takes a lot to get over. And there's just, I like to say to people who ask me, it's like, if you were to look at the wall behind me, I could cover it with 12 point font of all the different things I've learned. It would be covered in words. And it's like, when you're starting, you're up against me with that much information. There's no course that you can take that will give you that much information that you could actually put into practice with your next video. I will put into practice everything on that wall without even thinking about it because I've learned through doing. And so I, I tell people it's, there's so much you do learn from doing, and I'm sure you've learned a lot from um, working with Proco and others in the past, but there really is nothing compares to doing something yourself and it's something I struggle with now like everyone I look up to there aren't questions I could ask them that could really help me but it's like if I could be a fly on the wall and observe them while they're doing something I know I'd get all my questions answered right because a lot of times people don't even consciously know all these different things because they they just learn from doing the thing and that's that's what's efficient anyway well, and I, I think that those things are always open to people to go and do, you know, it's like, I think, I mean, I'm going to look at me five years from now and be like, oh, there's so much he didn't know. There's so much he could have been better at. And it was right in front of him all along, right. you know, and I think uh, looking at that, it's like, oh, it's, it's completely based off what I know, based on things that I can go and research right now, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and then the other part of that is just my, my willingness to go and do the work, because I think a lot of people in the same way they underestimate like the difficulty of a YouTube video, they had also underestimated the difficulty of making an animation or a comic book or something. And uh, something that I've been talking about lately with people has been like, you know, a lot of making Dune 2, Denis Villeneuve, uh, De Denis that. Villeneuve, or did I ever pronounce yeah. his name? It's one of my favorite movies. I love Dune so much, but a lot of that movie is figuring out where the porta potties go in the desert, <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> like, where do the actors, you know, piss and yeah. poop, you know? It's like, that's actually a huge consideration. And that actually might be 95% of trying to get the movie going. Like, what, catering, you know, flying people out, insurance, all that kind of stuff. And then maybe 2 or 3% of it is like Timothy Chalamet giving a great performance and Lisa on Al-Gaib and stuff. But a lot of a YouTube video is the same thing. Like, sitting in your room by yourself, repeating lines, like, cutting up footage, like, doing things that are actually pretty monotonous and tedious like making a, a great comic book a lot of it is redrawing panels like figuring out how printing works uh sending emails to comic shops to make sure they, they'll you know even stock your book and stuff and uh i think that a part of making this stuff work on a practical level is almost de-glamorizing or de uh like trying to remove the hero worship side of being a creative person yeah absolutely what a, I need to actually look up who, which specific uh, ancient master said this. Maybe you know, but it was like Galileo or Da Vinci. They said if people knew how much, I'll paraphrase it, but it, he said if people knew how much work I put into what I do, they wouldn't think it was that amazing anymore. And I, I took that and ran with it because it just made so much sense to me. It's... And just like you were saying with Dune, like all that stuff matters so much because there's nothing that 
Well, I'm sure there's there are some points of guidance that a director has with the actors, but all that is on Timothy Chalamet to do that performance. That's not really up to Dennis, right? There's certain things that he has that his decision impacts and placing porta potties allows everyone else to actually do their part to the max but that's not something you would ever find in a course on like how to direct a film or something like that right yeah well in, in, in the same way everyone is looking up how you know how to draw a head you know how to uh do concept art how to you know get a job in animation it's the same thing you know and I think a lot of this stuff comes down to kind of like a spiritual subconscious level of like opening yourself up to the muse, mm-hmm. you know, um, like the opening of the, the letting yourself ask or opening yourself up to the muse in the, in the Dune 2 sense might be like, you know, Timothy Chalamet never had it, would never have a chance to go and do what he did without the guy that set up the porta potties. The thing I'm trying to say here is that a big portion of the creative process, it's always hard and it's always risky. And there's a good chance that it's actually not going to follow through and actually be good, you know? In the same way, like, making a painting or a YouTube video, like, the, there's a chance you'll put in all the work to getting all the porta potties done, doing all the editing and all that kind of stuff, and have still, and have no one care about the thing that you put your heart and soul into. Uh, and I feel like it's important to find your why and have a good sense of self because inevitably when you do have those failures, you will be able to be like, okay, I'm going to move on to the next one. And whenever you have those successes, you will be able to not let your ego be hyperinflated to the point where you feel like you're, you know, God or something. Yeah. It's, I think the, it's the, the failures are so much more important because that's where you learn. And I think, like you said, if you know who you are, then you can make those failures worthwhile because we've been trained since school you know, that failures are bad, but that's where you learn things. The only problem is if you take a failure and you just let it make you stop or make you depressed and you uh, you don't look at things the way you used to, you forget your why because of the failure. But the failure is where everything is. The success is just like, uh, like it's just that little spark of, okay, so everything I learned works worked now in this moment, presented this way. And then you go on to the next thing, right? I'm earlier on my YouTube journey than you are, but I've had my first like successful video, oh, awesome. a couple of videos in the past few months. And um, I, I think in the beginning of the year, if you ask me like, all, if like, what do you want to do? It's like, oh, if I could just get one video that gets over 100,000 views, then I'll be content in my own journey. I'll feel like I'm making good progress and stuff. And then I made one that got uh, 170,000 views and stuff. And nice. I was very happy with that. And now I'm like, okay, now what? Now, now, now what's next? You know? And, uh, that bar for what makes me feel content and happy with myself. And that goalpost is moving further and further as I'm making more progress on, uh, the dream, you know, and, and, and the creativity and stuff. The thing I would like looking back to my first video that popped off, some of the things I regret are that it's not like it happened too quickly. Like I started posting the time between I started making traction and when I started posting was about eight months to some that's fast, but that's eight months is not a quick amount of time to achieve something, right? That's most people can't put in eight months of work towards something consistently. I didn't, it's just, you know, at some point I was kind of consistent, but there's this point where when that success happens, it you think it's because of this this and that but it's not really it's because of this other thing that you've only just scratched the surface of understanding and some people start youtube understanding that fully some people do it and they don't even know that they understand it fully they just do it well because it's their personality it's who they are and they stay really successful but for me i found it was very difficult to nail down what that was And so I think that could be part of like what you or anyone else striving to do something similar is like, it's when those successes happen, some like now I think about how did I feel when I came up with the idea? How did I feel while I was working on it? That could be the thing that 
results in those videos. It's not the thumbnail or the topic. Those are important, but it could be there's so many other variables. Well, in in, in a lot of ways, you just don't know. And uh, I think that's kind of where the relationship with failure and success has to be really in tune because um, that's going to continue to happen as you continue to make more and more stuff. Yeah. Um, and I, I can like looking back at that feeling I had when I was editing that video that did well, it was similar to every other video. I was just maybe a little bit more focused on the message of what I, I interviewed a guy, uh, the message of what the interviewee was, was saying. Mm -hmm. Um, and also looking at it from the perspective of like, I really didn't change the content of what the thing was about. I just made it more concise. Um, I made it more packaged for YouTube itself versus being, more of a longer, like esoteric hour and a half long podcast. It was a 27 minute shortened condensed version focusing on purely just the artist. I, 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 I think that's another point as well to that, that, that I've been learning is that uh, changing up your art is not always the solution to like more commercial or financial success. Um, it could be something that's like more business oriented or more presentation oriented on Instagram or you know, a use of hashtags or something seemingly arbitrary that ends up making the, the, uh, the big difference. Yeah. Like what you said is something that I've not only found out is particularly important when it comes to YouTube, like basically getting to the point to varying degrees. Um, but something I've mentioned on Kara recently is about just noticing how shifty my own personal style has been and reflecting on art as if it's a regular service job like any other job. Like really what we're doing is providing a service to people, even though it's really nuanced. It's not as simple as like, oh, I'm cooking food or I'm building a house for someone or I'm doing their finances. But sometimes, like you said, in those marketing areas, um, how you present it, you can adjust certain components of it that will serve people better that will actually result in much more engagement and value for other people. And doing that with art, I think is one of the hardest professions to do because it's, it's coming from you, your soul, it's creative, it's non-subjective, but there is, and anyone who wants to be financially successful doing their thing, you have to think like, how can I, what am I serving to people and how can I do that better? And that it just makes a difference if you can find that balance without losing yourself and your own ever evolving identity. Yeah. Well, and I, I think part of it is, uh, on, a, on another spiritual level, trying to, uh, serve other people versus serving yourself. I think a lot of real meaning and purpose comes from helping and serving other people. Um, and I, I think it's, it, it is important to create for yourself and do things for yourself, but uh, to make something like art truly meaningful, you at a certain point have to, I think, um, at least be like trying to elicit other emotions from other people, you know, other than just trying to make yourself purely content. And I, I think we all really admire those artists that are able to exist in a vacuum and create without external validation or, or mm -hmm. communication. But at a certain point, your ability to communicate ideas uh, that, you know, exist in comic books or uh, YouTube or whatever, like trying to exist in the medium that you're trying to be successful in, uh, having, you know, the ability to make compromises is, is actually just part of the process of being successful. At that I was going to ask if you felt a shift in the time you've been creating content more often in what your intent to provide to others has been or has it been always very consistent in what you're trying to give the thing that i'm trying to do with what i'm putting out right now is something like i i feel like i am somewhat of a deeply insecure person in a lot of ways and i'm, I'm saying that uh, on an empathetic level in the same way i think everyone is insecure yeah, in a lot of sure. fundamental ways and um in the same way that i think a lot of people tend to look at people who are bigger than them or more famous or better or whatever and idealize them or uh, get nervous from talking to them or anything. The goal here is to humanize and, uh, 
I guess, have a more objective view of the people that I'm talking to. It started out purely as just me doing that for myself, and it's transitioning into me trying to do that at scale. I, I, I do genuinely believe that the thing that are, that's holding most people back is themselves. Did you think other people needed that when you were just starting to try to do that for yourself? Was that something that you were aware of? Or were you just trying to like, you know, you found yourself like, okay, I need to dehuman, like not dehumanize, rehumanize, <laughs> I guess, uh, my, <laughs> dehumanize everybody. my view of other people, like see them more like myself. Is that something that, were you aware of that in the beginning? I think so. I mean, I, I think that, especially in art, I do see like a celebritization of uh, teachers and people who are painters mm -hmm. and stuff. And, um, you know, the Instagram, YouTube, you know, art station relationship is very parasocial. It's very one-sided. And I think that um, if your only exposure to somebody is uh, just through them doing this magic trick, you might think that they have everything figured out. I think the realization that everyone is just like you, anxious, afraid, um, happy, sad, angry, whatever, then the act of trying to emulate what they did becomes all that much easier, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I think you, like, you know, when I make a YouTube video, it, it's like the best version of me, <laughs> you know, it's edited down, it's, uh, it's organized, it's not chaotic, it's not like neurotic or any way, but realistically, everyone has some crazy flaw or deficit. If you look at any of the famous actors or directors or whoever, um, like Ben Affleck has a, a crazy uh, Dunkin' Donuts obsession, you know, oh, wow. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, yeah, or, or uh, and it, it's like portraying these extremely heroic characters, but also, you know, guzzling down a gallon of iced coffee, <laughs> you know, it's like one moment I'm somebody who I think has a lot of things figured out, and then the other moment I'm eating uh, a carton of Ben and Jerry's by myself, you know. Uh, th th there's a quote from Guillermo del Toro that I latched on to. It's like, his movies are about that dichotomy as a person from, like, one in the morning, you're, you know, with your wife and kids or husband and kids or you're, you know, you're just going to school or something and you're being a good person. You're, you know, feeding your dog. You're being very empathetic to everybody. And then on the way to work, somebody cuts you off and you call them a fucking son of a bitch, you know, <laughs> and you're uh, going from one extreme to the other within 15 minutes. And uh, I think it's the like archetypal idea that you have some dark stuff within you and your ability to be a fully realized person is like integrating that and understanding it. Um, yeah. Sorry for the long winded answer. No, I, I love that. that. That is, that is so, that is something I'm really passionate about breaking down as well. Like I was, I, I posted a rant on Kara about how Twitter is removing, they remove the ability to see what other people have liked. And I, you know, I get the whole, the whole purpose of it. But I don't like that. I think it's messed up like that people can get fired because they like a post that has contradictory views because people have this really unhealthy view of pe certain people as they're perfect and they are this. They, yeah, like they they see the aspect that you show and they see that as everything and it yep. causes so many problems and is a limitation, like you mentioned, to other people feeling like they can express themselves I, it took me a long time to realize how people perceive me on YouTube. I'm like, I, I was actually annoyed for a little bit. I'm like, because I put out videos, it's almost <laughs> like, I actually thought to myself, like, did I suddenly make myself seem attractive because I decided to point out, put myself out on YouTube? Cause that's not how I felt before YouTube, but apparently now it's a thing. It's like, why? But right. I, I realize that, like you said, that that balance is always there within everyone's lives. There's, you know, there's the terrorizing, angry version of you. There's the really nice and sweet and respectable version of you. And trying to repress one too much can really have some negative effects and be quite insidious. But as long as it's balanced, you know, like that person getting cut off in traffic, it, it in a, I think things like that enable you to be able to go back to being however you want to be. 
you know, because you yeah. can't. I don't think anybody can cheat life. Like, you can't be nice all the time just permanently and stay like that, you know. I I, I think it's literally impossible, and I think that's just part of being a person, uh, like a person. Yeah. And in the same way, I think that part of being creative and part of doing like really amazing works of art is the tedium is the setting up of the porta potties there. The other side of that is also like, you're also going to like lose your temper sometimes, or you also might make some mistake negative press or the negative emotions, people critiquing your work, uh, people, you know, disliking you for whatever reason is part of the process. Like I loved Dune too, but there's also a lot of things I would critique about the, uh, the new movie, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe it's not like exactly, similar to the book in the way I would have done it. You know, they omitted some things about uh, the Mentats and Thufir Howitt that I was kind of bummed out mm -hmm. about. He accepted the responsibility of making that movie. He was the guy that threw himself to the universe and the muse to, by setting up the porta potties to film Dune 2. So he's the guy that gets all the praise and all the um, uh, negative uh, stuff. Right. But Yeah, yeah. like people... The some, but I used to be, you know, and this is most people still, but you know, when you see those paintings, it's just like a blue square on an orange canvas, and people are like, ah, oh, come on, I could have done that. And it's like, I saw someone respond this same concept that I've seen in other places, but it really hit here. He's like, but did you do it though? But you didn't do it, they did it, and it's like, true, like, okay, now let's think of the logistics of actually carefully making sure that you paint a perfect square on a huge canvas and paint that yellow first that takes a long time that takes a while then you gotta convince someone to hang it up somewhere there's a lot of other things involved with that and so just like you mentioned like with dennis he, he definitely knew there's there's millions of people that are going to complain about this shit that i'm going to do but now Everyone, you know, either praises or critiques it, but it's there because of him. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there, you know. So yeah, it's just good to keep that in mind. Well, and I, I, I feel like from like an artistic humanist perspective, it's always better for the thing to be there than not be yeah. there. You know, um, I think uh, looking at something like a painting, and uh, I think it's easy to critique uh, John Singer Sargent or. Uh, I guess any of those famous portrait painters because they were painting the, you know, the wealthiest elite of their time. Mm -hmm. And we like romanticize that as being the best paintings when they might've been painting people that are actually weren't like the best people, you know, but at the same time, it's like everyone is flawed just because those paintings might have some baggage associated with them. doesn't mean that I'm not glad that they exist. Like, I, I think whenever these conversations happen, people tend to talk about the, you know, the biggest movies or the biggest painters and all that kind of stuff. But all these micro stories play out on an, on a personal basis mm -hmm. where it's like maybe somebody posted to Instagram and no one, it didn't get as much, as many likes, or maybe it, uh, a certain painting might have pissed some people off. But again, it's still worth the creation and it's still worth making it. I saw a movie on Netflix a couple of years ago, and it was one of the first times I felt like, holy shit, this is like me and a slightly alternate version of what the past year of my life was like. And then I saw another show on Netflix where the main character, um, I'll just, I think, what was it called? Dang, I can't remember, but the, the main character was an artist, had my name. And they were black and it was animated. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and it, just watching the character development and it was like really some sci-fi thing. So it wasn't like my life, but like the personality of the character, it was so interesting to see that. And it's something I'm starting to see everywhere now where before these stories seem larger than life, but it's like, oh, I see how I could relate to this and how this is some. This was someone's story at some point. A lot of the best stories aren't completely fiction the way you would think about it when you're like reading a fantasy book as a kid. Like there's a lot that someone is drawing from to give value to that experience and then it inherently makes someone else relate to it, which is awesome. 
Well, and I, I think it's like the, the thing that I've been trying to tap into more for myself is the idea that absolute beauty is around you at all times, yeah. you know, like it's even a miracle that we could be talking right now. You know, you're uh, on the other side of the country that to me, and we're able to have a conversation in real time that people are going to be able to watch, you know, and that itself is a miracle. That's something to be extremely thankful for, yeah. you know, but I think people tend to look at their lives and be bored by it or not see the potential in it or choose not to see the potential in it because uh, of all the, I guess, all the reasons we've talked about before. And um, part of the reason I, like, I, I, I guess I say this on every podcast, I'm not in a van right now, so it, it's not exactly a one-to-one, -one, but the reason I lived in the van and drove around the country is to see if I can, like, s like have extreme meaning and purpose in living in, um, you know, a non-ideal situation i'm living in a car sleeping on the side of the road peeing in bottles like sleeping in walmart parking lots all that kind of stuff and it was still an extremely meaningful life mm -hmm. you know and that was open to me at all times you know whether i was you know like i could i could go do that now i can go do that in 10 years uh, i could have done that five years ago or whatever um in the same way that like you can have an adventure by opening yourself up to maybe like you know taking a job you wouldn't normally take or uh, like walking someplace that you never would have walked when you normally would have driven or something. Um, and that story there, the, the world itself is incredible. Everyone has amazing stories to tell. I guess it's like something like the thing you're describing or, you know, Spider-Man or any of those things. I think the reason they resonate is because they're so fundamentally archetypal to uh, to, to, uh, to people's lives. Yeah, that's why I love Spider-Man and why I think it's been doing well, at least from my perspective, been doing super well lately with the the animated, uh, I, I don't know, trilogy, I guess you could call it. Um, like, it's just so relatable and the, like, the crazier stories from, sup like, Superman and uh, Batman, I feel like those aren't as relatable to at least one could argue they were never really that relatable, but they definitely aren't as relatable to the, you know, this, the newer generation that's consuming that stuff for the first time compared to a lot of the other stories like from Spider-Man now. And it's, it's really cool because it's, it's not boring, right? It's, it can be done just as well. And I think it's, I, I, I agree with what you said about the beauty and life all around us. I think it's something I actually have struggled to see a lot. I've had to make a lot of changes in how I view life for myself. And that has helped. It's been like a breath of fresh air or like just a breath of relief to be like, oh, okay, this is, this is still fine, even though I may not be able to do this or that. Um, and then all of a sudden, when I do that, I see all these other opportunities that kind of fill in the balance, you know. Well, and I, I think it always goes back to the idea, like, you have no idea what's going to happen when you do anything. Like, when you start a painting, it might be really bad. It might be really good. When you go for a walk, it might start raining. It might be totally fine. You might run into somebody you meet that changes your life completely. Um, and the problem is, is that the bad things can also happen. So the tendency to close ourselves off becomes more and more common based off our tendency to, I guess, give into the fear, you know, the fear is the mind killer yeah. sort, of, sort oh, of deal. Yeah. Uh, and I can say for a fact, if you try to close yourself off to them and then you're just increasing the chances of the bad stuff happening in so much worse a way, <laughs> there's no escaping it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'll tell you a, a, a real personal thing that's happening right now that is scary to me. I'm afraid that I'm like, we're recording this conversation. It's really nice and everything. And like, I didn't press the record button or something. You know, it's like, <laughs> so it's like in real time, I'm experiencing like, oh man, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Maybe, maybe I should have like prepared better and all that kind of stuff. And um, that being said, it's like, it's probably totally fine. It's totally okay. It, something ends up not technically not working out like, one person's audio doesn't work, it's still totally okay, you know? Yeah. Um, it doesn't make or break the uh, experience of having this conversation with you. The way that I, I guess the goal for me right now is like, I'm trying to get away from making everything work out the way I want it to. Mm -hmm. 
Um, because it will often not, and it's often going to be more uncomfortable and harder than you think it is, but it is still, again, worth doing. And I, I guess going back to the Spider-Man stuff, it, it's been kind of interesting seeing the interest levels in Marvel movies, uh, like Spider-Man Homecoming mm-hmm. versus uh, 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 The Eternals or something, you know? Like The Eternals is operating at the universal, like galactic scale of you know, of, of stakes, you know, the universe will end, the world mm-hmm. would end, but it is, fo- it is less interesting of a movie on a global scale and uh, ec- economic scale, I guess, than something like, you know, Spider-Man Homecoming, which is, you know, them going on a school trip to London yeah. or something, or them like, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's more of the Peter Parker's personal journey versus the, the crazy comic book stakes. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's a, like The Godfather really resonates with people. It's considered a much better movie than The Eternals when the stakes are on a much, much smaller right. scale. Yeah, I liked uh, A lot of people will complain that it's too, it's too much like about being woke and wokeism, but the newest Spider-Man 2 game, I was just amazed at like how it was... It was annoying at first because I was like, why is Miles, who has so much less combat experience, so much more powerful and fun to play than Peter? But then once you get to the end of the game, you realize Peter had a huge mental block from certain from the trauma of from Aunt May that once it was released, all of a sudden he's like back to his self. Right. And I'm like, wow, they really I don't know if they were I'm sure they thought of it. But that was really nice and nuanced to play, to pay attention to that really finite or really delicate scale balance where because of his mental condition, he's just not on his A game and he's actually performing worse than someone else who's newer. And I I really appreciated that. And they showed so many different examples of how to handle things and process things and like aunt may like had this brilliant solution to him getting frustrated and something that uh he was trying to hide as a kid and i was just like wow they they're doing a really good job with the writing for this and i think that's part of why it's doing pretty well and why it's relatable um but i'm really looking to see a lot more of that happen especially with it doesn't necessarily the existence of AI doesn't necessarily guarantee this will happen, but I'm hoping that it gives the ability to more people to be able to tell more stories at an even deeper level. That's even more uh, specific. Well, I I, I think for all this stuff, um, like the AI conversation, I think there's a lot of things to be like, like there are a lot of things to unpack with it just because it is so nuanced and complicated. Uh, I think on on one side it is, uh, you know, ethically very gray and you know very dangerous to a lot of people's careers but it also does open up the doors to uh a lot of people that wouldn't be wouldn't have been able to make stuff anyways you know um and i think that's ultimately good in the same way that everything has good and bad to it um i think ai is is another one of those things that is like okay like i'm really uh, we should definitely be cautious of it but ultimately um, someone who works as uh, a dentist full time, who has this really crazy story idea that everyone would love, but he's so <laughs> right. busy being a dentist, he can't create it. I'm glad he can make it now. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, and I, I guess on another level, like it, it's crazy and insane. Like it, you wouldn't think it would work this way, but people care and love the story of Peter Parker dealing with Aunt May. You know, that's the like that's lasted way longer than any other villain arc, mm-hmm. you know, like him fighting green goblin or him fighting, yeah. uh, kingpin or whatever will last like a single series of comic books or something. But his relationship with aunt may is a, is a thread throughout everything or Mary Jane mm-hmm. or anything, you know, and those aren't, those are personal stories. Those are things that everyone is dealing with, you know, um, everyone has like some problem with a girlfriend or boyfriend, you know, Every everybody, you know, everybody has some problem with uh, a family member or, or something, Grief. some like deep loss, like like Uncle Ben, uh-huh. you know. Um, and I was talking to some people about this, like Spider Man 
is the best selling comic book of all time, like above every other oh, wow. character, above Superman. I think Batman is close ish, mm. but it's a, but I think Batman is higher because of that empathetic, like, oh, he lost his parents, yeah, right. he's flawed. And he doesn't you know, really have stuff. powers, right? So <laughs> the, the things that make these characters interesting are their flaws and their vulnerabilities. Mm. In the same way that anyone listening to this, they have some thing happening to them that was that if it was turned into some story made into YouTube videos, comic books, a video game, whatever, would resonate with people in the same way that Aunt May and Peter Parker has. Yeah, it's one of the most favorite anime I'm watching right now, or my favorite. Um, it has the main character. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's like the typical, it's the isekai format where someone dies and is reborn into a different world, right? And usually when that happens, they become super overpowered and everything is easy for them. But it was amazing to see all of the trauma that this person had from being bullied and just a shut in from their old life. They have to now process it. And this one too, even though they're gifted with certain different abilities and seeing how that happens is just, it was just super enjoyable, entertaining and enlightening to watch. And I'm seeing that again, like we're talking about in so many different places and, you know, there's, I, I think there was a recent Netflix show about this guy experiencing just recurring issues around sexual abuse because of this one thing that happened to him. And it turned out it was a true story. And I was like, holy shit, how do, how do you have the confidence to, to tell people that in such detail, you know? But right. then I think about how much good that's going to do for people who are actually in the entertainment industry as actors like that, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome. Well, and, and, and like with all this stuff, I think it's like, like a question that I ask everybody, like, would you be doing the same thing right now if you had a billion dollars, you know? And the purpose of that question is like, if you had an ex machina come into your life and solve all your problems, do you still do the things you're doing? Do you still have trauma? Do you still have problems with certain people or not? You know? And it's like, if you suddenly became the best artist in the world with the most amount of followers, do you, you know, still trouble, like, do you, do you still have trouble, like, going to the gym? And the answer is probably yes. <laughs> you know, it's like, no matter who you are, you can't escape those things. There are things that, you know, happened to me when I was a kid that I will think about until the day I die. You know, some embarrassing fifth grade presentation <laughs> or something. You know, no matter how successful I am, no matter how validated I am externally, there's still always going to be something that, sticks with me in that way. Um, and I think part of becoming a fully integrated person is accepting that, accepting that, that as part of who you are, you know, loving yourself for all your flaws versus looking at yourself and being like, I'm weak because uh, I said something, I made a joke in class and no one laughed. <laughs> you know, it's like, it always comes back to the why. It makes your art better. It makes your life better. It makes it easier to eat better, you know. Yeah, for me... Uh, the one of the biggest things I struggled with is just not getting things intuitively like it seemed like everyone else in the world could do. And then I realized that when I if I accept that and when I accept that, suddenly I that means that the flip side of that is that I can be an excellent teacher because I have to understand certain things very, very well to be able to perform. And then that means I can explain it to other people in a way that really helps them. And that's why I was able to get to, you know, over 700,000 subscribers on YouTube, I think, because just my perspective on things that everyone has talked about already helps people genuinely. And so they stick around. And that is, that is so important what you mentioned, like that, that comes from accepting certain things about yourself that you may not like, or you may wish was different. Yeah, well, in empathizing with yourself, and I, I'm kind of going through a similar version of that. Like, I, you know, I wish I was like more into draftsmanship and drawing and painting than I am right now. Because you know, sometimes I'll get comments on my YouTube channel. It's like, all you do is interview artists. When are you going to see? When are you? When are you going to do art? And it's like, well, th th this is my art. You know, this is like, you know, and I I understand it, but there's always like that, like, oh man, like, I should be doing that. I should be doing this or whatever. And the more I'm able to lean into 
what I do naturally, you know, what I am inclined to do versus what I dream I'm inclined to do. The more success and the more money and the more followers and all that kind of stuff come as a result of that. Not the way that my brain is logicking it mm-hmm. out. The way I, like, the you know, my math brain is like, oh, if I do this and this and this, then I'll get followers. That doesn't work. And then I do something that's like, oh, I'll try this. And then that ends up being the thing that resonates with people, truly, you know? Yeah, yeah I, I do believe in uh, the universe uh, pushing people and influencing people to go down certain paths. Again, it, it, I think it's always your ability to be open to those to those things. Right. Yeah, I think it's been a really important part of a change in my fundamental beliefs where I think it was... I personally think it's kind of silly that we're taught evolution is based off of like survival of the fittest, right? Where if you look at it as almost something that still affects everyone and not over billions of years, but every single moment of your life, it's more so that it's just trying new things, right? What happens to be good for survival sticks around, but really it's trying new things. And there's, when I look at newness, if you look at things that feel new to people, there always seems to be so much reward behind it. Like whatever people perceive as new, whatever is challenging to you, that's, or different, that's where you get the most intense emotions from them, right? Not the thing that you've been doing already so many times. So I, I I agree with that. It's like getting pushed to not necessarily outside your comfort zone. Maybe I'm a little jaded from people commenting that on my videos so much. I'm yeah. like, I don't care what you say. I There is an infinite amount I can learn from the human body. I will keep learning it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, 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 it's absolutely. like just a new pose, right? Or a new just a new body type or a new perspective. It's, it's just so every little thing that you could say is new seems to have value attached to it, even regardless of positive or negative, right? New doesn't really have, it's in the middle of those. It doesn't, it could be negative or it could be positive. Yeah. Well, I I think, uh, as I'm getting more into this stuff, the more I'm questioning conventional wisdom, you know? Uh, like a few years ago, or even like 15, 20 years ago, the thing to do was to, you know, the way you became an artist was to go to CalArts or Art Center yeah. or wherever and spend $200,000 or whatever. And now people are still doing that. And I'm not, I'm not judging that decision, but YouTube is around. You know, people learn to draw. Everything is online for free, essentially. If you only listen to conventional wisdom, I think it's difficult to go and push past and be in tune with those subtle things that drawing the figure might teach you. Um, and it, it's kind of been interesting seeing the progression of concept art in the past, uh, Mm. 20 or 30 years, because, you know, in the nineties, it was the new cool thing. Uh, actually in the nineties, it wasn't the new cool thing. It was just the new thing. Um, and then people realized, oh, you can go and draw, you know, charge our banks for a living and have that be a living. Uh, and then it became the cool thing. There are clubs and all that kind of stuff built around it. And these new hierarchies of like, Oh, here's how you do it. Here's how you do concept art. Here's the masters of concept art. And now moving into this stuff, it's become completely homogenized and easy to teach and easy to start doing. And now AI is kind of taking over a lot of those, uh, those jobs and positions. Um, and it's like this, you know, 40 year or 30 year arc of something becoming completely brand new. And within five years, it becomes an old school part of the institution. And then equally as fast, it is getting phased out, you know, in the same way that like animation was also a thing and comic books and all that kind of stuff. The cycles it's there, there are cycles. It's something I'm trying to impress on anyone who watches my content at all now. It's like people, it's hard to see, I think, especially now because the internet has only existed for basically the time I've been alive. So it's hard to see the cycle compared to other ones that are way, you know, they extend past hundreds of years. But 
it's something that is a lot easier to find flow in if you stop trying to resist it. But it is also really scary and really easy to feel like you're being left behind somewhere. So I do empathize with people who feel... A lot of people get quite, you know, upset and aggressive over that noticing their pride and joy and their passion seemingly be replaced right before their very eyes. Well, and I, I think it comes down to something like external validation. It's like, if you had a billion dollars, do you still do concept art? Yeah. Or do you still do illustrations and stuff? And um, a, a thing that I suspect about you is like, I could not pay you any amount of money to stop drawing. Mm -hmm. um, and in the same way that we look at Kim jong Gi or <laughs> Ian McKegg or... Yeah. I don't think there's really much money I could pay them to, to stop doing the things that they love doing, you know. Emotion there or that feeling is like asking them to stop exploring yeah. or asking them to stop having a relationship with creativity, you know. It's like integral to being a person. And it's not like the accolades that anyone is addicted to or the money. It's the ability to go and explore or to find that, like, amazing amount of meaning in just a single sheet of paper and... A pencil. In the same way that is amazing amount of meaning exists in everything, you can also just break down everything in a very nihilistic, objective way where a piece of paper is just a, a shaving of a piece of wood and a pencil is a piece of graphite, like, like it's a rock and a piece of paper that are essentially atoms, which are quarks, which is all arbitrary because we're all, you know, floating around arbitrarily and it doesn't matter. You know? right. Or it is the Mona Lisa, you know. Yeah, I'm personally, um, I, I don't, no, I'm not like 100% sold on this, but I'm like, theoretically, you could write, <laughs> there could be a prompt long enough that would recreate me, if you really think about it, if you extend it to like quadrillions of lines long. And so I think to any extent, you could reduce something down to a really painful, nihilistic perspective. But at the same time, it has to be met by the just the the amazement of it the just that feeling of sublime you know when you when you reach a mountain top or you see yeah. like the ocean for the first time well and, it, and it's it's something that already exists for everybody you you aren't even the person creating it or the person that can take credit for it you're just the vessel that it's coming through at that moment in time for that second you know um, and to that frequency, it's like even someone drawing the same reference, drawing the same exact subject matter might elicit different reactions from different people, mm -hmm. um, which I, I know that's true, which is a very strange thing to observe happening in real time. But uh, that ability to like avoid the nihilism and be almost childlike in your, uh, I guess, like your the way you view art. Uh, I think that's the thing that I'm really striving for. Unfortunately, it's hard work. <laughs> it's, it's really hard work. Yeah. But I think, like I mentioned, with everyone creating stuff, I think it makes it easier for other people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I guess for anyone listening to this, it is always hard. Um, you know, I, I suspect that the thing you're doing now, it is the same level of difficulty and stress a lot of the times, uh, just at a larger scale than you were 10 years ago. Um, or 15 years ago, or, or whatever, you know, it's a kind of arbitrary at that point. I, 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 I don't know, it's like, a, I, I was listening to an interview from Christopher Nolan, mm -hmm. and he was talking about how um, him doing his, like, corporate interview movies, where he would be, like, just interviewing somebody for a gig, so they could send it as, out as, like, a memo for a corporation. And he was talking about how those gigs actually ended up influencing a lot of the movies he would do later on because of the lighting and the framing of people Oof. and tedious work ended up help helping create interstellar or the dark Knight or anything you know and again from one level it is a corporate interview from another it is the preparation for making like some of the most popular movies of all time just going off what you mentioned about the the if, what would you do if you had a billion dollars i think one of the best exercises to try as many times as you can is to put yourself in that state of mind when you're making something because if you were to ask me what I would do, it would be to take more risks. And that's exactly what I should be doing regardless. <laughs> but I don't want to, right? And I think a lot of people probably would agree with that. And I think that's 
one of the best exercises you can do on a regular basis. Well, and the billion dollars actually doesn't make it any easier. <laughs> you yeah. know, it, it's it's actually sometimes maybe harder. It's like a a billion dollars does not give you taste. Uh, a billion dollars does not make it any easier to try to sit in a you know in a room by yourself and grind on trying to make a YouTube video. Mm. Um, it is equally as embarrassing, no matter how good of a camera or you know any of that kind of stuff that you have. I think the earlier in your career, it makes it the harder it is if you actually were given that opportunity. Because then it's just like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, for sure. Well, I, I think a lot of people, you know, I always hear about the people talking about, you know, that 19-year-old or that 16-year-old that got the job at Riot or the, you know, the person who ended up being able to go and do this or whatever with this person because they were so young. But there's a whole other host of existential problems that come along with being that person. It's not just all sunshine and rainbows. It's people idealizing you, you not having a childhood, mm. you not being able to trust yourself because everyone is like, you know, when there's some 45 year old guy with three wife, like uh, three kids and a wife, uh, counting on you making art for his mortgage to be paid, he's going to be, maybe give you some shit if, you, if you're, you know, playing video games and hanging out with your friends, right. you know, and it's going to be totally justified. Yeah. Um, maybe having like a childhood and, operating at the scale of just being a person is not such a bad thing. No. Uh, and I, I, I often think about like the, uh, like Tolkien talking about the Hobbit, uh, the, uh, like the Shire and Hobbiton and stuff as like those, like, I, I think the quote is something like it's the act of everyday day folks that keep, keeps evil at bay or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's not the, um, Aragorn. It's not the crazy acts of heroism. It is the, bringing bread to your neighbor or something or helping a, a kid who just fell off a bike up and, you know, putting a bandaid on his knee or something. Right. Yeah. That's how you prevent the super villains from coming into existence. Cause then they're going to be like, Oh damn, that person helped me off my bike. I can't, I can't blow up the world. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Well, that's every, that's every villain's origin story. It's like, you know, Lex Luthor, you know, he's insecure because of whatever reason. And now he wants to have all the power in the world yeah. or, you know, uh, yeah, you know, Green Goblin or whatever, and uh, I, in the same way that I think, uh, like, the idea of chasing the the dream of being a famous artist can be really, really beneficial, but it could cause people to do things that are ultimately not in favor of the greater good. You know, um, maybe like treating people in a certain way or ignoring someone's humanity, maybe like condescending to students or uh, it's, uh, something that I see a lot of people do is. Uh, giving up everything to art at the cost of like being, being nice to people. Yeah. Like expecting more from people just because they did a certain thing or whatever. Yeah. It's, I'm trying to be, I've, I've engaged in a lot of those habits unconsciously and I'm trying to like undo all of that. And like, but it, then it gets to be too much. Sometimes I'll be like, wait, Am I trying to like manipulate this person by telling them that they don't have to rush? Couldn't they just decide that on their own? It gets so bad <laughs> sometimes in my head, but yeah, the, yeah it's just. Well, the, <laughs> the answer is like probably at least a little bit, right? you know, it's like, um, well, and, and it's like, I, I think, uh, I, I, I it, it, it's always strange talking to people with like a perceived, uh, either like heightened or lower status than you, because ultimately in the in the moment it doesn't really matter. But uh, before and after the conversation, it could feel maybe I don't, I don't know. Th th there's always that weird power or heart hierarchy uh, pervading everything. You know, it, it when I was working at Proco, my relationship with Stan was always very existentially very weird because mm -hmm. uh, he would go and do things that I would hear about people talking about just in art classes or something. Um, and then I'd go eat a sandwich with him, you know, and it's like uh, hearing people being exposed to art through Proko and then having this real relationship with him uh, or this like friendship with him. I think it was, it, it's like a, it was just existentially very weird. Yeah. You know, it's like when you see somebody that is somebody's hero being a person. Yeah. It's, I, that's something I try. It's it's hard to accept about even with myself. It's like I'll go 
I think the most recent person I experienced that with was Lowish when they were for the second time at um, Playgrounds in Motion. Yeah. And then after just a few minutes, it was like just a fun conversation with her and one of her friends. And yeah. looking back on how I approached it, it's just like, ah, why? <laughs> why am I so <laughs> like fangirly? But. I think, and it, it can't help. Right? Me. I'm fangirly about people too, dude. It's uh, like like it, there are people. If I met them today, I'd absolutely be starstruck. And I think it's it, it's like one other thing about all this stuff is like we could talk about this stuff intellectually, but then putting it into practice, like not getting yeah. angry, being a good person all the time, doing all that stuff, not lying, not being a dick. You know, it is hard. <laughs> you know, it's like sometimes we're grumpy, sometimes we're not our best, yeah. and I think that. Uh, it always comes back to the forgiveness of like, like I, I think there, you know, on, on a more personal level, there is like a, a subconscious looking up to you in terms of you being a much bigger YouTuber than me, mm-hmm. where it's like, oh man, I don't want to waste his time. I don't want to bother him. You know, I don't want to do all that stuff. When in reality, we're just two dudes talking. Um, but there's, there can always be that like weird subconscious energy that, that kind of goes on. You well, know? That's what's going to be good about this video because... People will see how once you get in it, it kind of melts away. It's there beforehand. Yeah. It'll, you, it'll probably always be there, but that's why, like, I think it's it's fun to just try to focus on getting into the thing as quick as possible because then you can enjoy it for what it is. And I, I think it relates back to painting in the sense of just like just starting doing the painting yeah. and just letting yourself be a painter removes all the uh, ability or the tendencies to think like, oh, I'm not good enough at perspective. I'm not good enough in anatomy. I'm not good enough at color, any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, how should people follow you on the internet? Uh, at Ergo Josh on YouTube, subscribe. And then Ergo.Josh on Instagram. And then just Ergo Josh on Kara now. Um, I'm being more active there. <laughs> um, <laughs> nice. But yeah. And then check out my website, www.ergojosh.com.